be world class, this is Break Down the Wall Radio with your host, Berg Jehanian. Welcome, everybody, to Break Down the Wall Radio. This is Bearge Jahanian, and I am so pumped up tonight. This is going to be an epic broadcast. But before we get started, I need to thank each and every single one of you. I've been working on building my, my public figure page, my Facebook fan page. And what's amazing is I broke 3,000 fans today. I, I, I got 300 more yesterday, and in the last four days, I've added... A th- over a thousand people to my Facebook page. Thank all of you so much for being a part of my community. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And I want to continue to add a ton of value to you because the more people I can reach, the more people's lives I can affect, the more people can have a positive mindset for life, the more people can understand how they can break down that wall that they have sitting in front of them that's keeping them from that success that you have wanted for a long, long time. The time is now. 2017 is your year. So let's do this together. So before we get any further, I want to introduce... Actually, before I introduce my guest, I want to let you know that if you like and share... Actually, if you share this post right now, all you need to do is share this post. And I'll remind you as we go throughout the broadcast... You get the opportunity to win a free book, and we're going to talk about that book in just a moment. So share this, like this, throw some some hearts up there. We love that. It encourages us. It makes us feel really good. I know you want to make me feel good. I know you want to make my guest feel good. So please throw some shares up there. And if you have any questions at all, all you need to do is post them in the uh, comments section, and we will be sure to do our best to answer the questions that you have. So without any further ado, let me get my guest up here. And there he is. This is my a friend that I met. I met him back in May of 2016, not even a year ago. We were both speaking at this event in Westchester, Pennsylvania, called One Life Fully Lived. Sean spoke right before me, and I was the speaker that followed him. So we met each other because we both went to the same room to speak and hit it off immediately. Mm-hmm. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He is a true servant leader. He's that guy that is he gets it. He gets how to be successful. And here's what I mean. Most people believe that there's scarcity in the world. One of my favorite quotes is a John F. Kennedy quote, a rising tide lifts all ships. And Sean Douglas lives by that. And that's why I think the two of us have have kind of jived together. And little by little, we're finding the different ways that we can feed each other and help each each other to grow and join forces to help each and every one of you grow, and this is one of those moments where we get to do that. So I want to introduce to you speaker, author, trainer, resilience coach, Sean Douglas. Sean, what's up, man? Man, I'm super pumped, man. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Are you kidding? This is this is gonna be a blast. I'm so <laughs> excited to have you here. You know, two people, I think we're gonna be we're gonna see who can raise the volume tonight the most. <laughs> you or me. The, the one thing I, more energy. That's right. The one thing I gotta ask, so I you know, the, the world, for the longest time, I think they thought your middle name was And Candy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot, man. Uh, my wife and I literally share a Facebook because, you know, and we get made fun of a lot, but I just believe that we are one and we weren't at one time. We had a lot of marriage problems, but, um, you know, we share Facebook because we share a life together. We share a family. We, I mean... You know, she's a big supporter of mine. So I have my own speaker page, but yeah, our Facebook, private Facebook is, yeah, it's always made fun of. It's my wife and I's Facebook together. So that's a great thing, though. You know, not a lot of people share things like that any longer. And I think it's a really cool thing that you do that type of thing together. And and she's she's a part of everything that you do. And I think it's almost a reminder every time you get on Facebook, you're reminded of your wife. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great thing. So listen, you know, I want my my folks to know who it is that they're listening to, who it is that's giving them some advice. And I know you've got you've got quite a story. You know, we we can talk about what you're doing now, which is you're, you're an author, resilience coach, you're you're in the military, you're in the Air Force, mm-hmm. and you're you're doing some really great things, and you're impacting a lot of lives in a really positive way. But it wasn't always like that for you. 
Nope. There was a rough pass that you had to get through in order to get to this place now. So you can tell us a little bit about that journey you took and how sure. things changed for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everybody thinks that success just kind of happens overnight or it happens in a month or two months or whatever. I can look back eight years and see my full transformation that happened. You know, a, a lot of people that they think – I'm, I'm going through this hard time and nothing good is going to come of it. But I can literally look back and see how I've pulled from that moment every single time. There's something that happens in my life and I pull from that experience. You know, so in 2008, we'll go back 2007, uh, you know, my wife and I weren't um, dating or whatever. We weren't together or whatever. But, you know, at my house burned down. I was an alcoholic. I was, you know, just in a really bad place. And I thought that drinking and having a lot of people over, even people that I didn't know, um, you know, I was just filling that void of, of what I was missing out on. So my, in St. Patrick's day, 2007, my house burns down. So I have nowhere to go. And you know, my wife says, Hey, why don't you just come hang out with me and get out of the hotel that you're staying in, you know, just come stay with me. Well, you know, a short time later, you know, we were married. But I still didn't want to stop that lifestyle. I still wanted to be that party guy that, you know, let's do this and shots. Everybody's taking shots, you know. So I was doing that. I was an alcoholic. And then I showed up to work drunk one day, and that was really bad. And then my wife and I were divorcing because I wouldn't stop my partying ways. And I wanted to go take these lavish trips and go do whatever I wanted to do. But, oh, yeah, by the way, I got a wife, and eh, it's whatever. So it wasn't always – that one flesh, you know, it was like, I'm still me and nothing's changed and see you later. I'm going to do my own thing. And uh, so she was divorcing me and took the kids and left. And that was the point where I couldn't stop drinking and I tried to take my life. And it was just like, I just, I didn't want to be here anymore. I was living a life that I didn't want to live. Now, before, before you go any further, let me, ask, let me ask you a question here. So you're living this life that you wanted to live yet at some point, you wanted to take your life because something didn't jive with you. What was that moment? What what started to cause that 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 uh, uh, that that conflict in your mind where this this is fun, this is what I want to do, but this isn't where I should be. Yeah, uh, it all stems from my childhood. See, my mom and dad were divorced, and my stepdad abused me and my two sisters. So when I grew up, I was like, man, I don't know if I want kids, and I don't want to like. I don't want to just relive or become that person that I, that I hated and despised so much. But when I got married and I was drinking because my, my ex stepdad was an alcoholic and, uh, and, and, you know, had a lot of, uh, explosive anger issues. And so what ended up happening was I got married, but didn't want to stop drinking, but I was an alcoholic. And then, you know, when we had kids, it was like, I felt myself because that's how I was raised or, that's what I experienced. It started uh, creeping into when I disciplined him or when I said something to him or if I yelled at him or whatever. And the looks that my oldest son would give me is the same look that I would give my stepdad, which would then spiral me out of control. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming him. And, and, and so I would, I would hate myself and then I would plunge into this binge drinking moment you know, to like mask my pain. And, uh, and, and the wife really saw what was going on. I was like, I'm out. Like, I can't deal with this. Like I'm out. So in order for me to not become the person that I despised, in order for me to not become the person that I hated so much and to break the cycle, I figured I'm just going to end my life. But, uh, luckily I, it didn't happen. I didn't go through with it. Uh, I got the help I needed. People reached out to me and, and elevated me and helped me become better and uh, after I got better, I had this powerful testimony of overcoming adversity and against all odds. And I became a drill instructor for Air Force basic training. And I took what I learned and, and I elevated. I mean, I developed over 600 men and women into military leaders during my four years as a, uh, as a military drill, uh, training instructor, as a drill instructor. So, so Sean, so, Sean, I think uh, this is important, I think, for the listeners to get because a lot of people, you, you said, in fact, you said at the beginning, success doesn't happen overnight. Right. Can you tell us what the time frame was with, you know, you, you got married, you you realized you were going down the same path as your stepdad and you wanted to take your life. And then all of a sudden people came to you to help you, to lift you up, to, give, to become that support group around you. Mm -hmm. And things started to go in a better direction. What was that time frame? Was it, are we talking about six months? Are we talking about several years? Two years. Two years. 
Two years. And how much yep. of that two years was a struggle where you were trying to change direction, but you you had to work at it? Two years. <laughs> <laughs> two years. <laughs> and you kept fighting through it. What kept you going? Was it support? Was it what you wanted, what you saw you could become? What kept you going? I think it was... After I got the help I needed, and you know, I talked to chaplains and, and mental health experts, and I talked to – but I wasn't in the personal development game. I knew who Tony Robbins was. I mean I, I knew exactly who that was and other you know, speakers at the time you know, like Zig Ziglar and you know, uh, other people. Um, I, I just – you know, Joel Osteen and all these people, like, I was just like, whoa. You know, and I was so anti-religion. Oh, my gosh. I was so anti-religion. Like you could not – Because you, it would you expose could, you, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, man. Yeah. Like I grew up Catholic. So we were in school, you know, in church after school, we were in Sunday school, we were in catechism. I mean, I lived like the Catholic life, you know what I mean? It was bred into me, you know, but at the age of 18, I was like, screw you, man. I'm out. Like, I don't need none of this, you know? <laughs> and, and now, you know, I look back and I look at the decisions that I made and it was me. Like I created the depths of my hell and I already had those existing self-defeating behaviors. But when I drank and, and took pain pills and, and did what I was doing and I was exhibiting those behaviors, everything I did, my decisions was exacerbated. Oh my gosh. Like, like what you focus on expands and my mind would just expand to the, to the depths of, I mean, depression that that i never experienced i'm like oh man she hates me and i'm just gonna go drink and and i'm in i'm in i'm literally living in that bottle because that's the only way that i think that i feel good because that's the only thing i know i was raised by an alcoholic you know what i mean right so uh you know when you know in 2009 when i became a drill instructor i wasn't drinking i had a moment of clarity where they said um let, you know, you should be a drill instructor. You know, my, my support, my commander, like everybody was like, man, you should be a drill instructor, man. It'd be cool for you. I'm like, eh, when I became a drill instructor, my, I mean, you know, like my mind was blown. Literally. I had that moment where my mind was blown. I fell in love with something I never knew I would have fell in love with. I had a skill, a talent and a gift I never knew existed. If I didn't go through my tragedy and my suicidal moments and then get the help and then go through that journey, I would have never – my gift would have never shown up. It would have never happened. It takes pressure to make diamonds, right? Dude, yes. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. And you, you experienced a ton of pressure. You had to go through that. And I, and I truly believe that there are things that we keep ourselves from achieving – Mm -hmm. Simply because we're afraid to go through the pain of getting there, and it's too and, hard. I don't want you know, to. You know, it's I, sometimes I feel like I don't have the right to talk talk about it in these terms, just because being a man is different from being a woman. But I think mm -hmm. if you look at childbirth, women have to go through pain in order to have that child. That's mm -hmm. just that's just what happens. That's what childbirth is about. And I think life is the same way. There's if if there's something incredible that you want. You've got to go through some pain to get there. And if you're afraid to go through that pain, you'll never get there. I, I, when when yeah. I was a teacher, I, I used to put this, this drawing up on the board, on the whiteboard, to teach my students about success. I would draw a little stick figure on this side. I used stick figures because that's what my dad always did with us. He always drew stick figures for us. <laughs> he told stories with stick figures when we were kids. He usually he nice. would draw them on the outside of hard-boiled eggs trying to get us to eat the eggs. It never worked for me. But it worked for my sisters. So I would draw the stick figure over here. And on the other side, I would draw. I would write Success City. And in the middle of it, I would draw these crazily shaped buildings with weird shaped windows. They were tilted. Everything. The buildings looked like they were falling over. And I called that Mistake City. And I told them in order to get through to Success City, you've got to go through Mistake City. There's no way to get there other than go through there. And all of the greatest minds in the world, all of the most creative people, all of the greatest inventors of the world live in Mistake City. Once in a while they have a success, but then they come back to Mistake City so they can work on things and learn and then go to Success City again. And it worked because kids started to understand that after a while, preaching it with them, of course. And they'd come uh -huh. back the next week and say, Mr. Jahanian, Mr. Jahanian, I was in Mistake City all week and I would high five them and, and they started to get it that it's okay to make mistakes and that in, in a lot of ways we have to go through that and it's so right. admirable that you saw that and you you 
and, and you went through it and you made it through to the other side and worked hard to get there. So once yeah. you got to that, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go, I was just going to say that that's the problem with giving kids participation trophies today. Right. I know that's an unpopular statement, but yeah. they're not going through Mistake City. Everybody gets a trophy, all right, but they've never been punched in the mouth. Well, guess what? When you're 18 and 19 and 20, and I was, uh, let's see, I was 18 in 2001, so 2008, so do the math. So I'm looking at like 23, 24 years old going through this huge adversity. I'm just like, are you kidding me? I've never been – you know, I mean, I've gone through hard stuff. I grew up rough, you know, but if, if I'm having, you know, everything handed to me and then all of a sudden an adversity happens and I get punched in the mouth, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to handle it. You know what I mean? So that right. was kind of, kind of where, I, I mean, I kind of knew how to handle it, but I just given up. I mean, ultimately it comes down to, I had just, I was, I just gave up, you know? So when you got to that place, you become a drill instructor. You realize this is a passion you have. You love this. You, yep. you, and it's it's unknown to you. You didn't even realize that you had this passion. You had this love for this. What were the steps? What are the things that happened next? What steps did you take? Where did you go with that? I mean, it, clearly you've gone pretty far so far mm -hmm. up to this point. But what what are the things? What are the changes that still had to occur for you to get to where sure. you are today? Yeah. Well, when we become a drill instructor, you go through seven weeks of school. And what really helped me go forward was that I have like an addictive personality. And when I find something that I absolutely love, I just immerse myself in it, you know, because I mean, time and money are two things that we'll never just give up just randomly, you know what I mean? Or just give up willingly without us feeling like we've invested it, right? So it takes a lot of time for you to master. I mean, you know, we're both speakers, you know, you did an amazing job in, in Pennsylvania, by the way. And you did you know, too. I mean, you just, I mean, you were a teacher and everything. I mean, anybody just can't just walk into a school and be like, I'm going to teach stuff. Like it just doesn't, that's not how it happens. You know? So we go through seven weeks of school and it teaches you how to build lesson plans, how to use your, you know, five voice characteristics, like pitch, tone, um, your, um, reflection, uh, uh, in like your, what is it? The, um, Reverse inflection, you know, when you do like inflection, because we have to call commands and stuff like that. So um, inverse uh, inflection, or then you have your different characteristics of like your tones and stuff. So when you're using your command voice or you're speaking in a certain way, you know what I mean? There's, there's all these characteristics of you speaking. And then after that, you go and you teach classes and then you have your interaction. But it's a seven week school that you go through. And if you can pass that, then you can then become a student instructor which you have a senior instructor over you teaching so then you have another eight weeks of you getting destroyed every day by this senior drill instructor who's been doing it for two three four five years screaming at you like you're so stupid you're never gonna do it you know and you're getting like screamed at and like i've driven out of the gate of the of the front base like i am driving i'm just like I hate this. You know what I mean? But it was like, it hurt so bad. They'd be like, you suck. Just go home. And you're like, I don't want to go home. You know, <laughs> but, I mean, after those eight weeks and you graduate that flight and all of the other drill instructors high five you and they hug you like, dude, you made it. Like, here's your hat and you made it. And like, you earned it. I mean, literally blood, sweat and tears. Sometimes mostly tears because you're like, I suck at this and I can't do this. And, but you can't give up, man, because the end game, the end result of, of what you're trying to achieve is going to be so much greater than the pain that you felt. Wow. That's incredible. What an incredible story. That I, I, I can't even imagine doing that. It's so contrary to the way I taught and to the way you teach in a public school, of course. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a totally different animal. That's rough to get through. You've got to you've, – I'm sure there are a lot of people who say, I'm done. I'm done. I can't keep doing this. And, and they give up. But listen, before we go any further, I want to remind folks who are, if you just tuned in, if you share this, Sean is giving away a copy, a free copy of his, his uh, book that he wrote called Decisions. And it's going to be a signed copy. I think he's, he's maybe reaching to, do you have one there you can show us on the screen, Sean? Yeah, I got a, uh, let me grab a book. Ugh. And so if you share this, you you are eligible to win the book Decisions. It's just Sean's very first book. So uh, the more people we get sharing, the more people are eligible to win this book. It's a great book. I have it on my on my Kindle. But you'll receive a hard copy just like this 
with signature, which is really cool. It's always cool to have Absolutely. a book signed by the author, and especially when it's their first book, because I'm sure there are many more books to come. So let's get back. Let's get back to the conversation, and then we'll, then we'll get into into the book. So you went through this whole thing. You became a drill instructor, and mm -hmm. was that the end of the journey? Was that where you felt like, wow, I've I've made it. I've arrived. This is it. Uh, nope. I'm a speaker. I'm this. I'm that. What 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 happened after that? Because th th that wasn't the end game. Oh no. Well, I never. So you never know what you're capable of until you, I guess you could say, step into your purpose. But once you feel like you are bringing value, once you feel like you are contributing, or once you feel like you are being fulfilled, your your mind just takes on a whole new, uh, just a whole new presence, man. Like I would go to work like like okay, we got this to do today, we got this to do today. They're getting like fourth week of of, of uh, training, they're getting their blues uniforms, and that's a big deal for them. You know, they're getting their blues, man. They're getting their service dressed. You know, that's that's like halfway point for them, you know. So it's my job as a drill instructor to be like, okay, guys, you're getting your blues today. No, man, I got to pump that up because you're leading people. And so every single um, every single flight that I had was between 50, maybe 55, I guess. Sometimes I've had 48, but around 50 to 55 young men and women. Right? For every eight weeks, I get I get a new flight. So I'm leading this flight through their journey, and they're looking at me like, you're the subject matter expert. Like, you got to know this stuff. So if I'm like, well, I don't know, it, your credibility is shot. So I learned really quick about credibility. I learned really quick about motivation. And then they were like, hey, man, if you're going to be this, this awesome drill instructor, for this first year that you're a drill instructor, you're a rookie. All right, so this rookie drill instructor, you don't know crap. You know what I mean? You're still trying to get certified in all your stuff, and you're trying to find your way. But I knew after that first flight, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And so I got into that personal development. I looked into Tony Robbins. I looked into you know John Maxwell and Zig Ziglar, and I started kind of finding myself. And each flight that I had, I learned something more about myself. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, let me let me kind of redo this. You know, we were talking about earlier about you know if you want to get some followers and if you want to get this um, kind of training, if you want to get this, like that didn't work. Okay, scrap that. Go to the drawing board. Okay, this works. Okay, let me tweak that. And then okay, that works. Let me put that in my toolbox. And I did that every single time. And after a year of being there, I completed my rookie uh, year as an instructor. And in 2010, I was awarded the rookie instructor of the year for all the rookie instructors. Wow. I was I was immersed myself in this so much from like zero four in the morning to sometimes you know not at nine p.m. ten p.m. eleven p.m. like I'm there like I'm doing it I'm getting like three four hours of sleep drinking two big cans of Monster a day because I love this so this was my version of professional and personal development and I man loved it and I rocked it and so this was the setting of where I developed for four years, I developed myself as a, as a speaker and as a trainer. Now, you said earlier that you knew of Tony Robbins, you knew of personal development, but you mm. didn't want to go there. I, I, right. I, I got to imagine most of us because a lot like, a lot like uh, uh, religion and church, it was exposing you for who you were, for who, what mm -hmm. you didn't have or what right. you weren't yet at that point. And what was it that happened that made you feel, you know what? I think I do need this personal development stuff. This, there's something about this that resonates with me. What made it okay for you, dude? It was the hunger, man. Like, oh, I mean, I was so hungry because I was, I, you know, I, I chased those aha moments. You know, when you're sitting there, like, it could be something like, uh, like a, I don't know, like a wall locker. Like, I had a kid, so we had a competition. Like, you have to roll t-shirts. Something as simple as rolling t-shirts would get aha moments. You know. So I'm like, look at these edges and this, and what you know, what if you took a pen in there? Like, I want to see who's got the most awesome T-shirt, you know? And and so I'm, I'm, it's literally a T-shirt, but I'm building them up like with their confidence. And then a kid comes over to me and says, "Hey, sir, I want to show you something." And he has a key because he has a he, the wall locker has a lock on it. So he takes his key from his lock and he puts it in there and he turns it like a sardine can. He's just turning it and turning it, and I'm watching this shirt get tighter and tighter and tighter, and I'm like, holy crap. I was like, you need to show everybody this. Like, look how awesome this kid is. And you see him well up in the face like my drill instructor who screamed at me 20 minutes ago just told me that I did awesome. 
this guy who is this mean, ridiculous guy just gave me a compliment. Wow. Maybe he is human. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just not about me, but being personable to them and building them up through the process builds their confidence for them to do great big things. Something as simple as a t-shirt would get an aha moment. And maybe I can do this. I'm like, if you can do a t-shirt, I bet you can do a towel. Yeah, I bet if you, I bet you could do, I bet you could do three people's drawers. I bet you could do, you know, and show people. And so they're teaching and training themselves, you know what I mean? And then they're building connections through a t-shirt. And I thought about that. I'm like, how can I apply that to my life? So I said, okay, well, let me research. And so I started researching. Well, let me look at speakers and see how their mannerisms are and whatever. And because I was so hungry to be better and I wanted to know more about how I could be better, I fell in love with the personal development part. And it just, I, I had to do it. You have to, you have to do it. So you began getting positive feedback in your life instead of the negative feedback. Whereas before the negative feedback you got, you were, you know, people love feedback no matter, you know, what kind of attention right. is positive or negative attention. We feed on it and you uh -huh. started getting that positive attention. So you wanted more of that. So you knew that the way to get more of that was to be able to better yourself. The better you were, the more you were going to get that feedback. That's, right. that's incredible. That's, and, and, and the more value I could provide people. Right. And, and I think too many times people stop before they get to that place. They stop before they get the understanding. They start at the end instead of starting at the beginning. And, and what, what I mean by that, I don't mean, I mean, you've got to have focus. You've got to have vision. And, and that's not the kind of end that I mean. What I mean is they try to get the result before they plant the seed. They try to get the leaves to blossom before they've even put a seed in the ground. Right. And what you're talking about is you built that belief for yourself. You built that root system so that the tree would grow. And you were okay with it right. being a small plant at first. And you're letting it blossom and letting it bloom and grow so that you could be more. And you keep feeding the root system rather than trying yep. to get the results. You're just feeding the, the roots, exactly. understanding that the result will follow. It'll and I, yep. I think, you know, we're in that this digital age, this fast food age, and people want things so quickly that they give up. And they use that word try. Their enabling mm -hmm. friends say, it's okay, Sean, as long as you tried, that's all that counts. And I don't know about you, Sean, but you were in the <laughs> Air Force, so I'm sure you got into a plane at some point, and there was a oh, pilot. Yeah. Well, you know, how when you're in, you're in a commercial, I've never been flown in a military plane, but in a commercial plane, the pilot comes on and he says something like, Ladies and gentlemen, we are now cruising above 10,000 feet. You can re move your seatbelts and walk around the cabin if you'd like to. I'm going to try to land the plane at about <laughs> I'm looking for the nearest parachute because I'm going to try to get out of the plane. That's right? all I know, right? So that yep. that pilot is landing the plane no matter what. His job is to put that plane. His job is not to, to try to land it. His job is to land it safely that right. is it and that is the only thing that is called success yet we settle for less with our own lives yeah we got in a plane we put our lives in the hands of a pile and say yep you're going to get me there i trust you and then when we get off the plane we say well we're going to try to do things and we think that's okay with our lives which i think is insane and ridiculous and i think it's incredible that you were able to go from that dark place that you were and bring yourself through all that pain and agony to where you started to get that positive feedback and then then and continued to grow from that. So how did all this turn into a book for you? So I, this is really crazy, man. So last January, you know, I said in 2015, at the end of 2015, I said, man, I really want to. So when I became, after the drill instructor, I left San Antonio, Texas, and I came to North Carolina. I met a guy named uh, Richard Lambert. Richard Lambert is the military community support coordinator. And so we got to talking and I met him and he's like, dude, you would be perfect for this program that, that we're setting up and getting involved in. And this idea, like you would be awesome for this. So I went through a resilience class and I was like, dude, I'm all about resilience. Like, let's do this. Cause I taught a little bit of it when I was, a, when I was in basic training. So I became a, a master resilience trainer teaching mental, physical, social, and spiritual resilience skill sets. Well, as I, became this trainer and transitioned out of basic training and into this new trainer role, I felt like I had applied all of the, and I felt like I mastered, when I say master resilience, I mastered these skill sets. And so I felt like uh, I applied a lot of those skills to my life. And all of a sudden I was like, man, I got so much to say. Like 
man, like I would see somebody, I'm like, dude, I know I can help you. Oh my God, I know how I can help you. And so I had like all these thoughts and images and whatever. And so December of 2015, I was like, you know, I think I should write a book. Like I think that'd be, I don't know, I don't know. I want to do something. I want to do something incredible in 2016. That's all I was thinking. So end of January, I wake up three o'clock in the morning, can't breathe. Someone is standing on my chest. That's what it feels like. I cannot breathe. And so I'm sitting, I'm trying to like push all this air in my face and I'm trying to wake up my wife. I'm like freaking out and I'm having flashbacks of, of when I was eight years old and I got pushed into a wall by my stepdad. And then I was 12 years old at my dad's house and we were lighting off fireworks and I was 16 and I was, you know, in a car accident and I, like all this stuff started flooding in these emotions and everything. And I started writing them down, you know, as fast as they were coming, I started writing them down and I'm like, Hey, what is going on? A couple weeks later, same thing happened. I, I remember when I was in fourth grade and we moved to another house. And I remember when I was in fifth or sixth grade and we moved uh, into my grandparents' basement. We lived in my grandparents' basement because we got um, we lost the house and and we were on food stamps and we were doing this. And then I was, you know, in the military and I was deployed and I was I was in a you know in a bad area you know in the Middle East in a deployment and like all these like I could literally feel what was going on at that time back in 2002. Now I could feel it. And so I was writing everything down, writing everything down. And then the next morning I woke up and I looked at everything I had and I was like, I literally have a chapter that I could build out of this. Like I, like I have something here. And so I started organizing all my thoughts and then I wrote down chapter titles. And then based on the name of the chapter title, I started writing my book and here it is. Here's my book. Amazing. That's incredible. How did that I mean, what did that feel like when that happened? Did you know right away this means I've got to write a book? I was going to know the doctor and so see if I had sleep apnea. <laughs> I don't know what was going on. I was like, what is going – like, oh, my gosh. Like, but what, what – and, and this might be an unpopular thought, but I think God was putting it in my heart to put it in my mind to save people. Like, I really do. In 2014, after I came back from my deployment – um, my wife was already going to church. I was so anti-religion still up until 2014. Towards the end of 2014, we started going to church. We found the Bridge Church in Princeton, North Carolina. And Pastor Farrell is amazing. But I always think that churches are all about money. And you're not going to convince me otherwise. Churches are all about money. It's a bracket, whatever. At this church, you can belong before you believe. That is their motto. Belong before you believe. I'm like, okay, whatever. After about a month of going, man, I'm hooked. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can apply this to my life and, and maybe maybe this is what I need because I still felt like something was missing. A year later, I'm, I mean, I'm serving, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, I'm doing my Christian walk and my life is amazing. 2015 was a great year. 2016, I said, I want to build a speaking business. I want to do this. I will do this. And all of a sudden, I was writing a book and I'm like, this is the start. This is what I got. And God was putting it in my in my mind and in my heart and putting it on paper and helping me develop what I was developing in, in terms of a book. So that's why every chapter ends with a Bible scripture along with two inspirational quotes that are not religious at all. So it appeals to the non-religious and the religious. That's incredible. So folks, we're talking about Sean's book that he just wrote. It, he just published it just a few months ago. Am I correct? Yep, that's yep, yep. It's called Decisions by Sean Douglas. You can get it on Amazon.com. But if you want to get a free copy, a free author signed copy, which Sean's going to hold up right there, you can do so by simply sharing this post and one lucky person, one random person will win a free signed copy of Decisions. So so take me through this because I'm actually in the process of writing my first book right now sure. as well. And I did a similar thing where I wrote down all the chapter titles and I even put some subheadings inside each chapter. I did it in two hours. I, it had oh, been awesome. in my mind for two years <laughs> trying to figure out how I wanted to put this together. And literally one day I sat down right here at my desk and in two hours I designed my book. And now I, as I'm writing it, I just say, okay, what's next? Oh, that's right. That's what's next. And it was all logically thought out and all makes a lot of sense. I'm mm -hmm. sure in the end I'll move some things around. But while you're writing this book, what's the process that you went through? What Actually, the process is the wrong question. What is... What are the emotions that you went through while you put this down on paper? Because it is a very emotional experience, mm -hmm. as I'm finding out, to write a book, 
to share yourself in that book, to be transparent about your life, to open open up and say things you've never said before many times to anybody. What's what's that like doing that? So how I did like if it was emotional for me, then it made it into the book. Like it kind of made the cut. So like one of the chapters uh, in the book, let, let's say uh, one of the chapters that I have is the road less traveled. Or is it like literally like I'm a dot, dot, dot. Per, I hate dot, dot, dot. Like if you text me, I need to talk to you, dot, dot, dot. I'm going to freak out because it's an unfinished thought, whatever. So everybody says, <laughs> well, I'll dot, dot, dot. Text so you, if I need you, later, you to call I'm me, like, right? You're going to call me real fast if I put dot, dot, dot. Yeah, dude, I'm a fr- like I freak out. Like <laughs> it's so bad though. Like I need to talk to you, dot, dot, dot. And you're like, well, well, that's an unfinished thought. Like, like what is that? You know. So <laughs> the basis of the chapter, the road less traveled, dot, dot, dot. Or is it? Is the fact that one of the defeating behaviors that we have is that we compare our ourselves to other people. Oh, I'm the only one that's going through this, right? There's no one else that's going through this. You know, they have the perfect little life. Look at my life. Look at my life compared to their life. It's so messed up. You know what I mean? So in that chapter, I looked at how, in the instances and the examples of how I compared myself to other people. And whenever one raised the most emotion for me, that's what made it into the book. Incredible. That's, you know, I, I, I'm starting to learn and find out, and you probably found out the same thing, that writing your book, while you, your intention is to write it for other people, to help other people uh, have a better life, to help other people be more positive, to help other people have that change that they, they desire, you probably found out that the book was written just as much for you as it was yeah. for them. I can't read the first chapter of my book without crying. I swear. Every time I read the first chapter of my book, even right now, um, maybe because there's a, there's a big audience watching, maybe I wouldn't. But um, if I grab my book or I'm like, hey, man, let me tell you about chapter one, and I start reading it, and there's certain passages like listening to Marty Robbins and Johnny Horton on my Uncle Tony's lap in his den. And so I used a lot of describing words like we were in a den watching a fire. No, we were in a um, dimly lit den by right. the crackling, burning fire. You, you see what I'm saying? I used a lot of describing words because I wanted you to. You put yourself there. The yep, I wanted to take the readers and put them there. I'm on my uncle's lap when I was six years old, listening to Johnny Horton and Marty Robbins. And we were in the den with the fire, you know, it was the crackling and burning sounds of the fire. And I, this is where I felt the most safe, you know. But I literally am feeling those emotions then, right now. And to this day, like I still – like when I was writing it, I was – and the wife was sitting right next to me. She was, you okay? I'm like, it, it, oh my god, how therapeutic writing this book was. And I closed the chapter on so many emotions and thoughts that I had about those events. I don't even think about those events anymore unless someone brings it up. But before, I would think about them like – I remember when I was seven years old and blah, blah, blah. Like, why am I thinking about that? Like, this is really stupid. That's another (laughs) self-defeating behavior is we don't put meaning to the situations and then we just focus on them. And it's, it's, there's no closure. Once you have closure on something and you close the chapter and each chapter was something that was emotional for me. And when I was done with the chapter and I placed that last period, that was the end. The period ended the chapter and I was done with it. And I emotionally closed off to those events. That's incredible. That's, I, 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 and you know, I know, I don't know if that's happening for me or if that will happen for me, but it's really fascinating to hear that. That's, it's such an incredible thing. You don't really think about that with authors. I mean, how, how often do folks who are watching right now, how often do you get to go into the mind of an author and find out what the emotions were that they were going through while they wrote the book? Usually they only talk in their little sound bites to sell their book. But right. it's really interesting to hear you talk about what the book meant to you and what it felt like to write that book. That's really incredible. Thanks for sharing that. So we're, we're kind of getting near to the end here. Uh, once again, I want to remind you, if you want to get that book, all you need to do is share this post. And if you share the post, uh, you get entered into the contest to win a free copy, a free signed copy of Sean's book, Decisions. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about books. We're talking about personal development. What mm-hmm. is the one personal development book 
that was it for you? If there's a book that changed you, what is that book that <laughs> oh, changed that's you? That's easy. That's easy, man. That's and it can't to, be the Bible, okay? And no, no, no. That's no, no, man. That's that's, that's the easy I'm, one. Like, a lot of people go to that. That's a go-to. Oh, book the Bible, book. like, yeah. That's. I mean, I, I'm gonna plug the Christian. You know, not not like Catholics and Lutherans and whatever, but just Christians. Like, you should be reading your Bible anyway, so that doesn't count. Like, that should be a daily thing. But the book that did it for me, man, was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Oh, I mean, I could read that book over and over and learn something new every single time. Every I'm gonna single ask time. You, I'm going to ask you an important question. This is probably – the. this is – folks who are watching, again, this is a really powerful question. If you want to figure things out, you need to ask this question. And I didn't realize it when I was younger that I was asking such powerful questions. I asked this question all the time. I asked mm -hmm. it so much that it drove adults crazy. But I'm going to ask you now, why was that book so powerful You powerful for you? And why did that book have so much meaning for you? Why did it change you so much? Because I related so much to it, you know? Like, maybe it's because I'm in the military. I'm not sure. But I think that humans are pack animals. And they want – they long to belong. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So when you think about, it, like, how to win friends, like, don't you want a lot of friends? You know, like when you're in high school and that that popularity, like you don't want to be the kid that gets shoved in lockers. Like you want to be the you want to be the popular crowd and you want to be the in crowd. And, you know, when you're at a party and there's three people standing in a circle, some of the one out of those three are going to feel left out. I, that's just how it happens. If you have four, then it's like two on two. But, but always when there's an odd number in a group, they always feel left out. So when I thought how to win friends, I'm like, OK, how to be this and that. And it gives you different tips on you know, how to, uh, how to influence in your conversation, how to be, how to be a disruptor and an influencer. But when I thought about like influence people, like that's what I'm doing though, but I'm influencing people in basic training. I never read that book until I got into be a drill instructor. That book formatted my mindset to say, I need to influence people and bring people to where they need to be. We have a gift. Every single one of us have a gift. And you need to find that gift. The main gift we have is the positive effect that you have in people's lives. So the question I asked, and I love that question, like, why is it? Because I learned that I was negatively infecting people rather than positively affecting them. And that book changed my mindset to be, I need to be a positive influencer. I need to make a positive impact difference in people's lives, and then they will follow you. Incredible. You know, and, and that made me think what you just talked about making a positive influence in people's lives it made me think about a year and a half ago my dad passed away and my mom had mm -hmm. passed away eight years before him so when dad passed away the house was going to be sold and all the things in the house there's something had to be done with all of them and i realized when my mom passed away all those things stayed there but when mm -hmm. my dad passed away all those things were gone and what it made me figure out was those things, we rent everything we have. The computer I'm on right now, the computer you're on, this headset, all the things you see behind me, everything we touch and see here on Earth, we rent. The only yep. thing we get to keep is the impact that we had on other people's lives. That's Legacy. the most valuable thing that we have. That's the most valuable thing that we can share with other people. It's not, it's not anything that has anything at all to do with money, although money can facilitate you to do that and have more impact. But that money stays behind. Yep. It's not ours. It, it, we rent it. That bank yep. account gets drained and goes to somebody else. The only thing that lasts is the impact that we have on other people's lives. And that's so powerful what you said. My last question. My last question is one quote. What's the one quote? It can be yours. Or it can be someone else's. Actually, I'll ask you two questions. What's one quote okay. that you have that you believe is a really important quote and one quote that has impacted you from someone else? So the quote that I give people, I guess, my, my big quote is that the one that I was saying that how you can positively affect somebody. But like a tagline would be like live your brand. Just just live your brand, man. Like live it out every day. Find opportunities to live your brand. Living your brand is if you value honesty, then be honest. If you value family, then show it. It's, it's showing up every day and being the best you. That's what live your brand means. Uh, I, I have two quotes. So one of the quotes is by Sun Tzu from the, from the Art of War. Okay, And I learned this in basic training from one of my commanders, my commander, Colonel Kinslow. He always used to tell us, 
from Sun Tzu, he says, look upon your, your soldiers as your only sons, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. <coughs> Treat them as your children, and they will follow you even unto death. That means, like, you got to treat people with respect. You got to treat people the way that you want to be treated. It, it speaks to me in so many different ways. You know, when you look upon somebody, like, you, like, we're sometimes more empathetic to perfect strangers than we are to our own family. You know, we don't hold the door for our, for our kids or our wives or whatever, but we'll hold it for a perfect stranger because we're trying to be nice to them. You know, you got to be the same way all the time. And then uh, another quote. Uh, that is really kind of just stuck by me would be the biblical quote would be Jeremiah 29 11 for I know the plans I have for you because I don't know what's going to happen, but God always does. And so <laughs> that, that Jeremiah 29 11 is my go-to quote. I live by that. It's, it's, it's having faith because faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the overcoming of doubt. So got to have faith in the process. And it took me eight years to be where I am today sitting with you. Incredible! Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, th- this was awesome. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it again, even though I just lived <laughs> through it. I want to watch it again, and I encourage all of you watching to oh, watch yeah. it again. Share with some pe- some people. Share with somebody that you believe will get some value from this, because that's what it's all about, right? It's about sharing things that are of value to other people, or showing someone else that you care enough to share something of value with them. So I want to want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And I want to let you know that next week, next week's show, Sean, have you ever uh, seen this story up on Facebook? I, I'm sorry, up on YouTube. It's a video of this basketball coach up in Rochester, Pennsylvania, excuse me, Rochester, New York, where he had this uh, student manager who was autistic. And the last game of this student's senior Uh-oh. year, he senior had him year. dressed for the game. Yep. He dressed, and then he got a three-pointer, wasn't that right? Oh, he did more than that. In the last two minutes of the game, no one knew this. The coach decided, I'm putting this kid in. He put him in, and the team, he never said anything to the team. The team fed him the ball. They they loved this kid so much, they just fed him the ball. He scored, I think it was 20 points or 22 points in the last two minutes of the game. Just training three-pointer. He missed (laughs) the first one by 10 feet. The coach thought, what did I just do? The kid bounced the next one, and then he just started draining them one after the other. The well, crowd was going nuts. Right. Oh, my God. They were going nuts. Right. Nobody coach Jim that. Johnson. Coach Jim Johnson. That must be a great coach name because I already know two ma- two famous coaches with that name. Right. Coach Jim Johnson will be my guest next oh, week man. on Break Down the Wall Radio to talk about that, to talk about you know his story, his book, his student story. Where that student is today. It's a great I believe, book, by the way. I've read the book. It's an amazing book. Yeah, and his his the 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 I think it's the ten year anniversary or something like that. The eight year um, the, the anniversary. I think January fifteenth is coming up. Maybe January fifteenth mm-hmm. is gone, isn't it? Whatever. The February fifteenth maybe is what it is. The the anniversary of that game is coming up. He's going right. to be right here next week on the show. I'm pumped up. I can't wait. I met him oh a few weeks gosh. ago out in Los Angeles. And it's going to be a blast. He's going to give away one of his books as well next week. You definitely want to be here for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I'll, I'll be posting the video up on Facebook so you can all see that. Uh, it's it's going to be a blast. It's going to be very, that's very awesome. cool to have him on here. So uh, that's next week. And I want to I want to thank everyone for being being here this week. And thanks, Sean. So uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to say goodnight, everybody, and that is it. That is it for this week's episode of Breakdown the Wall Radio. We will see you next week.